My guest today is often described as the funniest American comedian of his generation. He rocketed to international fame as the cuddly alien from the planet Orc. He later made his mark in Hollywood, shouting the unforgettable line, Good morning, Vietnam. He's manic and eccentric, but he also has a serious side. In his latest film, he plays a Polish Jew in a wartime ghetto, trying to build hope by stretching the truth. The Germans don't want the Americans to take that, you see? So the Americans are in the war too? Well, they didn't say they were there personally. I mean, they have problems of their own. They're fighting on another front. But for now, they're sending tanks. Tanks? How many? Not many, but enough. And brand new, right off the boat from Chicago. Chicago? Yes. How, yeah. how could you tell they were American tanks? Well, you, you get to know the difference. You know, American tanks, it's a different noise entirely. What kind of noise? Clean. Yeah, you can hear the your horns. On the tank? No, the band. The, band. the jazz band. The jazz band? They sent a jazz band to cheer up their allies. Saxophone? Clarinet. Sounds like Benny Goodman. <laughs> Robin Williams, a very warm welcome to the program. Thank you. A warm hand to my opening. Thank you. <laughs> Jacob the Liar is a very bleak film. Did it test your sense of humor? Yeah, because we were shooting in Poland in, in what was the Jewish ghetto in a, in a town called Piotrkov. Yeah, because as an American, never having been anywhere near that type of horror or abuse or deprivation, it was, we were very you know, reticent to even get near the humor in that situation. But after talking to survivors, reading about it, that, that it existed. But it was not, it's not like a joke, per se, but it's almost like, like, like great Jewish humor. There's, there's such pain in it that it, you know, it's just to keep you going as a survivor, to become a survivor in the face of that. Was it hard to make the humor work under those Yeah, to find it, to find the right level. I mean, to not, to make it very specific for the characters between each other, to make it, that's what helped and to have a director like Peter Kasovitz, who was a Hungarian Jew whose parents were survivors, and to, who basically would sit there and say, you have to forget your own sensitivity to these issues and just harden up, toughen up, and become a survivor, become someone who's just getting through day to day. Making humor out of a situation where one of the characters, the barber, for instance, is climbing on a chair to hang himself. Yeah, but it's a, literally gallows humor to keep, you know, to say, wait a minute, I have something. To, go ahead and hang yourself, but you'll miss something. What? And, you know, that thing of what do you do? Because they're friends, they have memories, you know, they have this kind of friendship where they're always very combative, but that's what, what kept them going. It's still a memory of who they were before the war, before all of this, that the Germans would try and, like, there used to be a line in the script that he took out, but it was like, they cut down all the trees, which is what they did do, to deny cover, but also just to kind of deprive you of anything from before. And Jacob was basically asking God and his wife, why do you cut down the trees? They're not Jewish, are they? And the idea that, you know, what is it? Why? How do you keep going when everything is denied you? And the thing he says is little things, the smallest connection with somebody else allows you to keep going. And, you know, the camps were one step. The ghetto was a step before the concentration camps. And the link were the trains, the transports, were, which would come and take, you know, liquidate the, the entire town. So it was always there. And because he worked in the freight yard, it was always there. And you see the trains, there's something quite horrific about them because everyone knows that, that the trains were the transport, you know. It sounds as though it opened your eyes in a way. My eyes mean I'd known about it. You read about it. It's one thing to read about it, then all of a sudden you're in the place and you're in Poland. And you're coming, you know, Poland is just now, in all of Poland, there's only 4,000 Jews. We went to a Passover service in a temple that was with 32 people. And they'd had to move the temple from another place, another room that they had, because someone had put a swastika on the door. And the rabbi said, why are they anti-Semitic? There aren't that many of us. And does it still exist? Yes. Some days we were walking to the set with the Star of David and an old Polish drunk would come out going, Jew! And you knew that he was the age where he probably yelled it the first time, too. How did that make you feel? It made you, it was just this momentary thing, it just there was such an anger, and yet you realized at that time they couldn't respond. At that time, could we have all gone and probably nailed him, you know, you know, jumped, you know, pounded on him? Yeah. But yet it was this thing of, it, there's an anger and a debasing thing and how he did, yeah, it was immediate. You know, it was, people had to kind of restrain people, say, just leave it alone, because the Poles restrained him, they pulled him away. But he was drunk. But you knew that that was still there, the same anti-Semitism. It's such a strong sense of place, isn't it? And particularly when Immediate. you use it's not, local, You're not shooting on a set, extras. and when you have local extras, 
I mean, not that many of them were Jewish, but some were. And yet there was one man who was a survivor who played an actor in the movie, uh, Janusz, the old man who I said to him, there's no radio. What do you mean, what is, th and there's no radio, and then eventually he dies. He was a survivor. It was even more surreal to think he's doing a movie about what he lived. And he was the one that said, do not be afraid of the humor, it existed. And that was why, you know, it's for us, it's like, all right, just keep going. Make it, do the movie, make it as dark as possible and yet have moments of humor in the face of that. Will it be accepted? I don't know. You know, this was a movie made two and a half years ago at the same time, if not a little before, Life is Beautiful. The idea of making a, humor with, making a movie with any humor about this subject was like, can you do this? And yet we did. I mean, it's, but it, is it as much a comedy as Life is Beautiful? No. It's more of a drama with moments of humor. And that's why I think it's interesting. Did you have a favorite moment where you thought the humor worked best? There's the darkest moment for me is when all of a sudden he's sitting with Kowalski talking to him and said, there's no radio. And then he's, Kowalski, it's the blackest joke of all. He said, the Germans are tearing apart the, the ghetto and there's no radio. And that laugh he has, which is, you know, he's, he's, it's like a, he's laughing and sobbing simultaneously. That's the darkest moment. Hard to come off the set after that and to wind down, isn't Very. it? Very. Yeah, it's difficult. How, do you, how did you do it? How do you manage you try it? and just, you know, I call home and just you call and see how your children are. You know, the hideous thing is to think about... The scenes with Lena are very difficult because the, the little girl played by Hannah, you know, it's, he's very much, he's, it's not his child and yet he's trying to take care of her. And she has a face that many Europeans say looks almost like Anne Frank. She has a face of a woman and the eyes, but they're still the eyes of a girl, a little girl. Those were the toughest scenes. You, you know, enjoyed trying to play the part of the radio, didn't you? For her, it's fun because doing, it's very specific. Voices. Yeah, because it's for her. It's very much about her, making it happen for her, but yet not letting her see, you know, keeping the illusion alive for her and making it not look like you're performing for her, but really creating the radio. It's, yeah, it was very interesting. It's very, very specific stuff and very, you know, doing Churchill for her, doing Stalin for her. Churchill, yeah. you got them very well. I, you? Yeah, that, the Churchill with the Polish accent. And the Polish people, I am worried. Yeah, it is, and then kind of filtering it through, you know, to make it sound like they're speaking through there. Yeah, it was interesting to do, and, you know, to, to walk the line even with that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the BBC in London. Tonight, we have a special guest, the Prime Minister of Greater Britain, the very honorable Winston Churchill, who is just now coming into the studio putting out his cigar. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in Poland. He likes the Polish, doesn't he? Of course, we're his allies. Is this the face of a more sentimental Robin Williams? <laughs> no, I don't think it's sentimental. This movie ba basically fought that, which is great. That's why the humor helps to fight the sentiment. But it is just moments of humor, isn't it? Yeah. More sentimental? No, I mean, I've been very much more sentimental than this. I mean, this actually toughened me up. It's been good. It kind of gave me a sense of, you know, humor keeps fight sentiment in a wonderful way, it diffuses it and, and kind of keeps it at bay. But a similar mood in some ways to goodwill hunting? No, oh, God, I can't find that comparison. <laughs> but thank you for trying. <laughs> Similar mood? No, not at all. But thank you. Let's show him what is won. <laughs> for trying to compare Goodwill Hunting and Jacob. No, but the more serious side of you. Mm -hmm. and a damaged or kind of, you know, a very... I mean, Goodwill Hunting is about a, an alcoholic, basically, finding redemption and helping a boy. I mean, with this, this is about a man, a survivor, a man who'd, who'd survived just by being totally innocuous and now is forced to be in a position where everyone's relying on him which is very interesting. You're more interested, I think you said, in, in doing films that actually say something rather than just standing up and telling jokes. I've, I've actually, I'm interested in both. <laughs> and I think I'm going to try to do both when I do stand-up now, when I go back and prepare, is to talk about things like, you know, Charlton Heston and Guns and Moses and the idea that Charlton would like to make a movie where Jesus comes back, but this time he's armed. You know? <laughs> he's back, second blood. Watch <laughs> out, pilot! I wash my hands! <laughs> <laughs> He's back, second blood. No, um, to do both, if you can do it, is, is quite a trick. Is stand up where your heart is? Versus San Francisco? <laughs> um, yeah, I have a great time doing stand up. It's where my whole body is, I think, because it demands everything mind, heart, soul, body, you know. 
It's like prize fighting. Or like last night I was watching Andre Agassi playing tennis. It's, you know, ideally it's this thing where it's really alive. It really is important. And you can talk about extraordinary things, you know, and that helps. It gives you your edge, do you think? It just gives, it, it fights fear. And whether that's an edge or not, I don't know. I mean, but it, it helps me just get back and, you know, put it all out there and, and stand behind it. Because there's no, there's no net, there's no intimate saying it's the director. It's the project, it's the director did that, or the script was not right. And then people go, no, it's you, smart boy. Hey, pretty furry boy, make me dance. <laughs> make me dance, yeah, come on, bring it out. Yo, put it out, Robin, put it out. I don't know, it's, it's that idea of just seeing what you can talk about, you know? And as we approach the millennium, when your computer will suddenly go, yeah, too many zeros, too many zeros. Yeah, Goodbye. Three, <laughs> three zeros, three zeros, good night. You've got Moyle. What, when did you get Jewish? It's that thing of, what can you do to talk about all these different things? And the simple stuff, like life. Do you still do the uh, old voices like the ghost of Albert Einstein and Kissinger? K and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> I heard a great quote. This is a quote I was reading this book last night about the 20th century. And Kissinger had a great quote. He said, the wonderful thing about being a celebrity is when you're boring, you're boring someone else, people think it's them. <laughs> and you can think of him going, thank you, Henry. That's all right, I'm going to go bomb Cambodia now. <laughs> I have access to tools. <laughs> I, also, I almost started to make him sound like Gregory Peck. <laughs> have you seen that, boy? Don't be afraid of me. <laughs> I'm going to be a Nazi, and then later on I'm going to play a Jew. Is that all right with you? <laughs> In the tradition of great Gentiles playing Jewish people, starting off with Heston playing Moses. Why couldn't you have Groucho Marx play Moses? That would have been great. Come on, we're going someplace. They're gonna part the water and we'll meet on the other side. <laughs> Bring a light meal. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, boss, that's no good. Hey, wait till the sea goes, Rusty. Here we go. I want all my Jews hanging close to me. The rest of you, good luck. You're on your own. Do you find Clinton funny? Oh, in a way that's quite extraordinary. Of all of this stuff, I mean, my favorite, my favorite thing of all was watching the congressional hearings and seeing Jesse Helms just sitting there with wood Basically going, you know, yes, could you read the part again where Mr. Lewinsky um, slowly undid, undid, yes. Could you do that part a little slower this time? <laughs> and do uh, you have tapes too? Anything else? Pictures? No pictures? How sad. <laughs> you know, now that it's part of, it's part now of the congressional record, which is, you know, you're, they're selling Stunning. It. Yeah. Hi, psst, yo, psst. Psst, I got congressional record here. Yeah, come on, brother, psst. Want pictures? Yeah, here, I got a tie. Psst, psst, psst. You know, and how it's, there was so much to talk about with that, but it just got to the ludicrous point. How, how much do you realize that Americans are descended from Puritans? People so uptight that the English kicked them out. The film that was released before Jacob Patch Adams. Mm -hmm. What is it about you and doctors? I don't know. I mean, I like the rubber. <laughs> you know, the difference between a $20 proctological exam is this, $40 is this. Um, I think it was, I mean, I'm fascinated more by the, the patch as a person being this man who's so outrageous in trying to help people. I am, I mean, it started maybe with Oliver Sacks meeting him and meeting this extraordinary human being who, who describes unusual conditions almost from the inside out. Have I played many doctors? Yes. If I play one more, I have to go to medical school. I'm afraid I've actually gotten a letter from the AMA. You need actually intern time. So it's important that I, I was just drawn to the characters themselves, the people, like Oliver Patch. And the Fer kids who are real kids, aren't they? The kids were all Make-A-Wish children, and they're extraordinary children. And in some ways, people are going, how can you use them in a movie? So they had a wonderful time. They had a great time being in a film, and it was important for them. And it was important that they were in the movie. The humor lasted, didn't it? Didn't the nurses tell you from the hospital that the humor... Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the as, it, as it has lasted. an effect, as they say, in any hospital that... It's, it goes down to what Oliver told me about human contact works in conjunction with medicine. It's, there's some, it's very much part of it. It's part of the healing process. And they've, they've, they've done things about this for years, but it's more about the feeling of comfort, but also just compassion. There is something there that uh, if you sense another human being concerned and working with you and using humor and, and all different things, whatever, it's not just humor, it's everything. But it's human contact, just simply knowing how to touch a patient touch a child, touch someone who's in pain. That's a real important thing. That's Gave you a lot, that movie, didn't it? I knew it from before. I knew it from working with 
I've done different things in San Francisco. There's a, there's a wonderful hospital, a children's hospital. And this one, I met an extraordinary doctor who, who's now dead, but who was always making his medicine available for anybody, especially for children from all over the world. And he was an extraordinary role model for me. Those are the people I admire, people like Oliver, people like Patch, people who are like Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, who go out and put their ass on the line, literally. For them, yeah, I believe that they are, if, if I have heroes, it'd be people like them. And, you know, if I do movies about them, it's because of that kind of uh, admiration. I was feeling so bad. Nice. Nice. Do I look thin to you? I said, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm just trying to lose a little weight. Is that too much? Have I gone too far here? Donner, party of 50. Donner. <laughs> Donner party over here! I don't know what's wrong here. There's something basically. I'm trying to lie to the dials here, but the uh, bottom line is your uh, TV's broken here. <laughs> My name is Officer Patio Furniture. I'm here today to talk to you briefly about narcolepsy. Narcolepsy! <laughs> My name is Dr. Phil. <laughs> I'll be your surgeon. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> done enough children's movies yes I think it's time as a woman in Deauville there was a great French question at the Deauville press conference she said you have done a lot of movies about children don't you ever want to just after you finish a movie with a child go home and be with a woman with big tits <laughs> Yeah, to which you replied. I went, oh, very much. <laughs> Is that an offer or a question? <laughs> it was like a very French question. You go, what about these, Robin? What about these, your children's movies? These could be your children. Look at them. Talk to the twins. <laughs> Let them love the twins. And I felt, I said, as a doctor, I'd like to numb them. She went, numb them? Yes. Numb, 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 numb. <laughs> and she's like, what? What do you mean, numb, 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 numb? It's a joke, madame. C'est un anglais, mais pour vous, c'est nécessaire. But it's like... Yeah, I've done enough children's movies, but I still will do them when, in the future because I have children. Why can't they have great entertainment? I, I, for a kid, a movie like Flubber or Jumanji is wonderful, especially like Aladdin. A movie, a cartoon is, is a great joy. It's a great joy to do, to see, to give them a voice and then watch them create a character totally not yourself. That's wonderful. I will still do children's movie. I don't care. You can write about it. I'll be there. Wait for me. Me and Jesse Ventura. I'll be there when he's president. One time only. Al Gore. He's got him in the boring death hole. Watch out. Wait for me. Sorry. <laughs> that was a campaign ad. Wasn't yeah, campaign ad. That'll be great when instead of these debates they have one time only steel cage debate. Bring it on, George W. Bush. Bring on your dad's deficit. I'll be there. Just have to kind of, it's that necessary release. Feel better? I do, thanks. It's <laughs> nice to think that politics may become like that. <laughs> How lonely was your childhood? I was an only child. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't. I mean, you, you learn to play with yourself, pardon the pun. But you have, you, you adapt, your imagination, you find a way of getting through it. It wasn't awful, no. I had a, actually a, a kind of a wonderful time because of that. And then later on, you know, I, I learned that it was very interesting and how it formed who and what I am. You created a lot of characters, did you? Yeah, little things that didn't really surface till college, where all of a sudden I realized I had this mimicry, this ability to... Because I think I'd been kind of listening and absorbing all that stuff, and then in college I had a chance to release it. So who were you mimicking in those days? My grandmother, who I never met, who I'd always do her on the phone. Sonny boy, talking to you. I'm out right now watching Elvis. And you know what I would be doing? She used to love to watch wrestling, so I would... Right now, gorgeous George has a man in a hold. And I would talk to her, and I remember doing, and I would do her for my mother and make my mother laugh. Because she would, you know, be just, oh, that's so good, now go to bed. But, you know, <laughs> she, you know, it gave me, I think that was a start. What about your dad? It was a distant relationship? No. You called him all. sir? I called him sir just as every child should, sir. <laughs> <laughs> sir? Sir, I'd like to go to sleep now. Certainly, sir, not ease. Assume a lazy posture. <laughs> no, <laughs> you must go out of bed. Sir, may I urinate? Permission to urinate, sir! <laughs> You're 30. Come on, boy. He was, uh, I did call him sir, but I, the wonderful thing is I got to know him much more like, as, as, it's like almost like Mark Twain. Like you get to know, I got to know him. By the time I was in my, uh, in my 20s, I really got to appreciate him. And he was lovely. That's why I thanked him at the Academy Awards, because he was a very honest man. If my mother's an optimist, if she's the one who would see a, a room full of horse shit and go, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> my father would say, there's nothing, just a room full of horse shit. But 
he was the one that said, uh, I said, Dad, I want to be an actor. He said, that's great, just have a backup profession like welding. <laughs> and he went, great, Pop. So I went to a welding class, and the welding instructor had one eye. You know, before we begin, I'd like you to know that, you know, sometimes actions and can happen with acetylene. And went, I've got to go, thank you. <laughs> nice talking with you. And he was just very honest and very direct. I just wanted me to have a sense of the world as this, you know, it's a rough place. And I think I carry both their sensibilities. Fame came too early for you, didn't it? That sounds like 25, 26? 25, 26, I don't remember. It was actually, fame was that good. <laughs> they say if you live through the 60s, you, know, you can't really, and they say you really remember, you're a liar. It came, I think it was a 25, 26, yeah, that was, it was pretty wild. But didn't then, bring you much happiness in the beginning. I'm not going to lie, there were some moments of happiness. <laughs> It's like they asked Madame de Gaulle, what is the most important thing in life? She said, a penis. <laughs> a penis? She said, it is so much better than an happiness. <laughs> but it brought me, there were moments of, you know, there were moments of, you know, fun and joy. I'm not going to say oh, I wouldn't have done it for five years or whatever. But what's finally sobered me up was the idea of having a child. And I wasn't having the child. My wife was having the child, you know. I was not passing the bowling ball, as they say. And I wanted to not miss that, so I sobered up. And I did it without, you know, Betty Ford or, you know, AA. And people keep saying, you're a friend of Bill's? And I went, Clinton? No, friend of Bill's, you know. Uh, the other group, Alcoholics Unanimous. But I did it on my own because of one reason, my son. And I'm, I thank God I did. I think you once said that you were working through your personal life like a hemophiliac through a razor factory. Yeah, like a hemophiliac working in a razor factory. Thank you for bringing that memory Th back. Things have improved. <laughs> yeah, very much, yeah. Um, no, life is extraordinary now. It's really wonderful because I'm, a, I'm aware of it, the, c the connections with friends and family and everyday people is quite amazing. What's next? I don't know what's on the schedule. <laughs> uh, a movie about a robot comes out at Christmas called Bicentennial Man based on an Isaac Asimov short story. And then that stand-up movie where I just go out and you know, perform stand-up for six months and then film that. And God knows after that, you know, I'm edging towards it's extreme drama, as you say, going onwards. I'm hoping in the twilight of the zenith of my career to survive the millennium and move on and find out that there's in the future some great role, maybe Gandhi on ice, I'm not sure. <laughs> something else, something, I mean, there's more stuff to play, more characters. What do you look forward to? I look forward to, I mean, finding the next great part, to finding the next extraordinary a character, a great character, you know? I mean, there are so many out there. Some woman today asked me if I wanted to do a remake, do Mork and Mindy as a movie. I went, oh, please. <laughs> here's, um, here's a book I'm going to show you. This is a book. Book. Friend. Good book. Library. <laughs> Library. Book. Come. Don't be afraid. <laughs> book. Good character. Not like this, not like Disney, like with the hunch backpack, but good. Good. You like conversations like that? Yeah, good. Yeah, friendly. Ah, I keep an eye out for you. No, I mean, I just want to find more, more pieces like Jacob, extraordinary pieces. I mean, if, and keep trying different things, comedy, drama, and, and everything in between. Robin Williams, I wish you luck. Thank you very much indeed. For thank being on you, the program. sir. Buona fortuna. Grazie. <laughs> we thank you and behave for all this. Will you sign the treaty now? <laughs> Bring us. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.